Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is award-winning author Victoria Bond. Victoria is a writer and professor. She holds an MFA in poetry. She is an essayist on issues of both personal and political topics, and she teaches first-year writing at John Jay College of the City University of New York. Victoria is the author of the Zora and Me Trilogy, a fictionalized account of the childhood of American author and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston. The Zora and Me Trilogy explores the wonders of childhood and the horrors of coming of age in the Jim Crow South. The Zora and Me Trilogy draws on the reality of the African-American experience to tell socially conscious whodunits about how friendship and resilience can empower us all to understand and confront injustice, all the while inviting readers to explore Hurston's own seminal work. Victoria, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Fantastic. How are you and your family doing in this very unusual year? Yes, it has been. 2020 has been one for the books. It's strange to have a book come out (laughs) in this year, but thankfully we have been fine. I'm more full of gratitude now than probably at any point in my life. Fantastic. I have to think that just the nature of what we're going through right now, this pandemic has probably been a godsend in some ways because it gives you, in some ways, time to sit down and stay busy, stay active, which can include running the book. It also has other challenges when you have kids at home, I'm sure. The mere act of writing books is just an amazing process. And and I think you and I were, were chatting just before we got started. I love the conversation around interviewing the authors. And for me, writing a book was extremely difficult. I mean, it was hard. But you know, when I see someone such as yourself, an accomplished author, and you have this trilogy, to create the story and keep it going from book one to two to three is just totally amazing. I would love if you could share, Victoria, for our listeners, a little bit about your background and how you came to this profession of writing and, and why, secondly, the, the Zora and Me trilogy and really this historical fiction around the work of Zora Neale Hurston? It's a funny question, in part because this trilogy was co-authored, it's co-created. So it began as a collaboration, and it ended with each of us writing the second and third book separately. So I wrote the third book, and my co-creator, Tanya, wrote the second book, but we wrote the first book together. One thing I have to say about writing is that it is so much easier writing with someone. (laughs) You know, we wrote to each other. We were in dialogue with each other. We were having a conversation with each other. And then we also could cover each other's blind spots. And Tanya and I met in 2001, I think. And from the time we met in publishing, I had just graduated from college. I was pretty sure I wanted to write, but I also needed a job. And I knew that writing wasn't going to support me or anyone immediately. Not that it does now, frankly. (laughs) But I found this job in publishing where I met Tanya and we became fast friends. And almost immediately, you know, we would just brainstorm and kick ideas back and forth in a way That was the birth of the Zora and Me trilogy. It was just kind of two friends just kind of kicking back at lunchtime, thinking like, would this be interesting? What do you think of this? I have an idea. What do you think of this? Kind of going back to the idea of collaboration and coaching each other. I guess this was now 2000, maybe like 2005-ish, 2006-ish. I had just finished my MFA in poetry and I decided that I wanted to actually try to write prose. I wanted to try to be a novelist. And I sat down and I wrote my first book from beginning to end, finished a manuscript. And it was really horrible. It was so bad. It was like shipwreck bad. Oh boy. And yeah, and I knew it was bad. 
And I gave it to my friend, Tanya, who co-authored this series with me. And, you know, and she told me the truth. She was like, yeah, Vic, this is pretty bad. But you have kid characters and those are the sections of the book that actually work. So I thought, huh, right? If I want to write, if I'm serious, you know, I'm starting to get in the habit of just being able to sit down and write enough to finish a book. Maybe I should think about focusing on now what is my strength that I can see from this experience, which is working with kid characters, making the kids the center of the story as opposed to the adults. That's very interesting. I, I think looking back through our podcast series, there's one in particular where it was two young ladies and each was writing, I don't know how it worked out this way, a very similar story. And they came together by happenstance and just started to chat. And then they realized there's power in two of us versus just the one of us. And I love that. And and I have to admit, in the spirit of full disclosure, as I was preparing the show notes, I did notice you had your partner on the first book, but it, it literally just did not even dawn on me that she was writing the second book. As I was doing some research about you and, and on your book page, I realized she was there and it's like, oh, now it all makes sense to me. I get that. So yeah, I, I want to talk about the books, but but first... Mm -hmm. Zora Neale Hurston, how did she, and in her childhood, so now you are writing about, you know, the in the Jim Crow South from, from the perspective of a very accomplished woman in her own right, but also from the perspective as a child, how did she become the protagonist in the, in, in these books? Well, you know, Zora Neale Hurston is such an extraordinary figure. If she didn't exist, someone would have to invent her. I've heard that quote before. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think it's something that I have felt from the beginning of this process through now. And now, actually, now that the trilogy is over, I feel it more strongly, actually. So, you know, Zora Neale Hurston was born at the end of the 19th century in Alabama in the Jim Crow South. And her parents are kind of go-getters, they are dreamers, and they decide that they are going to move to this new all-Black incorporated town of Eatonville, Florida. For some of your listeners that might not know this, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there were a lot of exclusively Black communities that were built in order to create kind of safe, prosperous spaces for Black people in what were very dark times in our country. So Zora Neale Hurston grows up in one of these communities, which is very unusual, right? There's a Black sheriff. Her father actually becomes a mayor of the town, right? So we have a Black mayor, a Black sheriff. She's surrounded in this small community by Black people in positions of great authority, renown, and respect. And I think if Zora Neale Hurston had been born any place else, we wouldn't have Zora Neale Hurston. She's this brilliant, iconoclastic, even little girl, but she has this kind of special place that really allows her to grow. She becomes a teenager and her mother dies and her family very quickly falls apart. And for about 10 years of Zora's life, she's pretty much on her own and on her own in a way that has not been easily tracked by the historical record. She writes in her own autobiography that she worked as a maid, that she worked in a circus, that she was a, a domestic for a theater troupe and this sort of thing. But by the time Zora resurfaces in 1916, 1917, she lies and says that she is 10 years younger than she actually is so she can enroll in high school. And from there, you know, she's on this real professional role. She graduates from high school. She goes to college. She transfers to Barnard College in New York City, where she becomes the first Black graduate and becomes an anthropologist and also at that time kind of luminary of the Harlem Renaissance. So if you can imagine someone who has lied about their age, everyone in Zora's life thinks that she's 10 years younger than she actually is. And she does this in order to get a foothold in education, 
in order to be a woman that lives freely, that pursues her mind. This is hard to do now, let alone in the 1920s and the 1930s for a Black woman. Her story in that regard is just so inspirational that I really wanted to explore kind of the origin story. So what could have made this woman so extraordinary for her time? Zora was ahead of her time when she was alive, and she's still ahead of her time now. So we just wanted to give kids kind of the origin story of a kind of the, a Black girl genius. As a late 50, early 60-something guy, white, grew up in the Midwest, Detroit suburbs, lived in Chicago, until I began researching to record this podcast with you. I have never heard of Zora Neale Hurston, but I came away with, after reading about you from your website, then I, I did what every smart person does. They go to Google and they type in, you know, Zora Neale Hurston and started to see that there is a whole other room of, of opportunity to learn about this individual. And I'm curious, how did you discover her? How did she come onto your radar or your collaborators radar? Like, this is who we need to be the center of this work we're going to collaborate on. Well, my co-author, Tanya, has a background in anthropology. Uh. So she actually came to Zora as a college student, thinking of her and learning about her as a folklorist and kind of a keeper of American history and African-American stories. Because I'm a little bit younger, I was actually given a book while I was in high school of Zora Neale Hurston's work. And at that time, I wasn't aware that she had this whole career as an anthropologist at all. I just fell in love with her as this like magnificent, beautiful prose stylist. For me, starting to work on this book, I was just, there's a line of Zora's, I've been in Sorrow's kitchen and looked out all the pots. And for me, I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to write an ode to the soul that had experienced that. And that could so beautifully and so earthily state it. So for me, these books are just kind of an ode and a celebration, just of a great spirit. Very good. So let's talk about the books. You sat down with your collaborator, Tanya. How did you, first of all, agree on the perhaps ground rules? This is what I'll focus on. This is what you're going to focus on. How did you begin to collaborate around those books? Well, for the first book, it was actually very seamless because we started before the time of Google Docs, which I can't believe now even exists. We had a very old fashioned process where I took on the responsibility, God help me. Now I would be more squeamish about doing this, but we discussed the whole book, kind of had a plot. And then I took on the responsibility of sitting down and just writing it. I said, you know what? I'll draft it. I think I can do it. I'll draft the book. Three or four, five months passed and I had a readable draft and then I sent it to Tanya. And then, of course, we were talking, you know, we were very, very good friends, but we didn't always really talk about the book. And then maybe three months later, she sent me back the draft of the manuscript that had been completely changed. There were new characters, scenes were gone, new scenes, you know, it had all been shifted and shuffled. So we went back and forth like that until we got something that we were both happy with. Now, the second and third book, in part why we wrote them separately, is that we couldn't decide on the same story. <laughs> we each wanted to tell different stories about Eatonville and about Zora. And once we realized that our stories weren't a part of the same story, but were actually completely different books, it made sense for us to just kind of split the work in that regard. And Tanya took on the work of the second novel. And I finished off the series. Could you read each novel as a standalone? Yes. Each of okay. these books are standalone novels. Absolutely. Okay. So that 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 helps me. So I, I'm thinking, you know, growing up, I had the Nancy Drew, the Encyclopedia mm -hmm. Brown kind yeah. of mysteries. And yeah. All right. Okay. Gotcha. 
Good. Yeah, well, you know, that's something else that's fun about these books is that each of them is a standalone mystery and each of them plays with a different trope in the mystery horror genre, Okay. right? So the first novel is really a monster story. You know, it's like, who killed this singing, you know, this traveling musician? Was it a monster or was it a person? And the second book, it's really a ghost story about the history of Eatonville, this ghost ghost arises and comes to the attention of the children, Zora and her best friends, Carrie and Teddy, and kind of leads the kids to this unknown history of Eatonville. And in the third book, you know, it's real, it's a zombie story. It's about how we deal with the past and how we cope with trauma. And I use a zombie as a kind of a symbol of the healing or the lack of healing that can occur around, you know, horrible events. Well, you know, I, I now realize, uh, Victoria, why you kind of laughed and smiled when I talked about my history of zombie apocalypse focus <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, we fit right in. And that was one of the most fun parts of working on these books has been being in dialogue with uh, the scholarship and the writing of Zora Neale Hurston. So there's like some fascinating stuff that Zora recorded actually studying zombies and voodoo, you know, in the late 1930s in Haiti. As I was going through the notes, this word jumped out at me, hoodoo. Uh-huh. And that is, that's kind of, that is, that's voodoo, right? Or, yeah, okay. yeah, you know, voodoo is a kind of African American take on kind of the magic and spiritualism that I think most people commonly associate with, say, Haiti and Jamaica. There's a version of it in the late 19th and early 20th century in the American South that was called voodoo. Okay. And, as you were writing the book, and again, uh, I mean, we easily could have had Tanya on here because to kind of talk about the collaboration, but that's maybe that's another podcast. Who knows? As you're writing the book, what are you learning more about Zora uh, Neil Hurston? What are you learning more about the Jim Crow South, Eatonville? Because, you know, it's interesting just given all that's been going on this year, there was there was the anniversary of the really this terrible event that took place in Oklahoma City. And I had never heard of Eatonville. I, uh, so what did you learn about these towns, which were, you know, like a, it's like a respite from everything else that's going around here where we can we we can be safe within our community and take care of ourselves. What did you learn about this in those three areas? Working on the books and the research for the books is kind of, as you noted, it's kind of a layer cake, right? It's dealing with a, a historical figure. It's dealing with a historical setting. And then it's just kind of the writerly stuff, like what's the story here? What's the plot? You know, is this more ghost story? Is it more mystery? That sort of thing. But to speak directly to your question about Black settlements and Black towns, you know, the paradox at the heart of them is that that people built those places in order to be safe, right? In order to build businesses and have schools where they felt that they could live on equal footing, right? With the people in their community. The paradox of it is that those communities were actually targets. So when a prosperous group of people gathers and begins to create more prosperity, then they are targets for the people in the surrounding communities. It's a threat. It's fear. It's, exactly. So these people that are just trying to band together to try to do okay on their own become a threat to surrounding people, right? So so for me, that's kind of, that's the main takeaway. When people are trying to be independent and self-sufficient, that that is threatening when people perceive those communities as taking resources away. Okay. And what did you come away with in your understanding of uh, Zora Neil Hurston as well, as an individual, as really an accomplished individual. So now I also 
I have to go out and do some more <laughs> research on her. And so let's see, maybe there's some other opportunities for podcasts. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I did a podcast with Ben Justison. He wrote a book on George White, congressman in the Jim Crow era from North Carolina. And just and you used the term a minute ago, he used the word equal. I forget the exact context, but, you know, an equal chance in, in life. And that's all we're looking for. And so that's what this community in Florida was, have an equal chance of prosperity, success, health. Then unfortunately, bad people conspire to, whether it's out of ignorance, fear, who knows what, to conspire against that. It's, it's unfortunate. But thinking about Zora Neale Hurston, what did you learn about her now in this journey of writing this book? How has that kind of evolved? And will you write more stories with her as the protagonist? I think my time with Zora is done. Okay. I think <laughs> I think I have I think I have put in my time with Zora. I think the thing that's changed over these years is when I first started this, I was really enamored with her flamboyant personality, her kind of life of the party way about her. You know, this is something that often comes up in other people's writings about her, that she was just so much fun, that there was not a better storyteller around. If you wanted to throw a good party, kind of invite Zora. So I was really taken with that idea of her. And over these years, the thing that has most impressed me about her is all the, the sadness and the grief that she carried that actually propelled her to break these barriers that allowed her not to see barriers, right? If you've been in Sarah's kitchen and licked out all the pots, right? Someone wants to tell you, you can't do X or you can't do Z, you know, you'll figure out how to do it, right? If someone tells you no, you'll figure out a way around it to write your book or figure out how to get enough money to travel to whatever place so you can meet the people that you need to in order to, you know, finish your manuscripts, to finish your research. So again, I started this, you know, again, enamored with kind of the, the life of the party, Zora. And I am ending this research just kind of in awe of what it took to live the life that she did, you know, especially because her work falls out of fashion. She is, you know, kind of resurrected in the 1970s by Alice Walker. There are decades where no one reads her work, you know, people in college taking American literature classes, African American literature classes, anthropology classes don't know that she exists, right? And Alice Walker, you know, goes on this journey, locates Zora's grave in Florida, and really does bring to light Zora's work. This is another kind of story for the ages, kind of of the starving, unrecognized artist, right? She was someone who did a lot of work, has a lot of writing, came to some renown in her lifetime, but then really did fall out of fashion and died an anonymous person. Where she lives in Florida at the end of her life, people know that she used to write books or that, you know, she did some other stuff, but they just know her as an elderly woman who cleans houses and likes to fish, right? You don't think that that's, you know, kind of the end game for someone that has had such a bright star. For me, Zora's life is about doing it your own way and being okay with however that turns out, long as it's what you decided and what you worked for and what you fought for. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about the awards and also the feedback from the, the community of individuals who are keeping Her Flame alive today. Let's, how has that impacted or the, informed the journey you've been on to tell these stories? I think if we didn't have Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple, we wouldn't have Zora Neale Hurston, right? If we didn't have Zora Neale Hurston, I don't know if Alice Walker <laughs> would exist, right? Because she relied so heavily on Zora's work in order to lay her own path. So I think that 
a lot of us, especially women writers, especially African-American writers, we really do trace our lineage to these seminal figures who showed us how it could be done, showed us how you can follow your own path and do the work that you really want to do that you think is interesting. And that there is, there is a, there is a path to walk, right. That, you know, I'm really lucky that I, I don't feel like a Zora, for example, or even an Alice Walker feeling like you have to, you know, pave it all yourself, right. Feeling like the path that you want to go, you ha literally have to make it. I, feel lucky in so far as that I'm walking on a path that others have paved before me. In terms of the Zora, kind of the Zora community, it's interesting because I really think of, you know, because there's folks that write scholarship on Zora, biographies on Zora, write articles on her novels and articles. You know, then there are other folks. There is um, a graphic novel about Zora. There's a book about Zora's relationship with Langston Hughes, you know, the great Harlem Renaissance poet. And our books... Um, feed into that. And I feel like we're kind of part of a fan community. This is like kind of like a highfalutin, <laughs> you know, like fandom in a way, you know, when there's this whole body of work that's just about, you know, this person. And a lot of American writers and American personalities have these kind of fandoms around them. So I think, you know, Zora is kind of claiming, we help Zora claim her place on that mantle just by continuing to feed the, all the work about her. Okay. You know, I'm curious as, as I'm, you know, listening to you and I'm thinking about all the, the various ways her story is being kept alive and, in, and informing new students at the high school, college levels, grad level, grad school levels. Do you see these three books as screenplay worthy? I do. Yeah, I do. I feel like these books are a TV show. <laughs> you know, and each season has a clear endpoint, right? Who killed Ivory, right? Whoops. <laughs> the second book. Yeah. Oh, well, no, but yeah. So the first book is about who killed Ivory, the traveling musician, right? You know, the second book is like who tried to attack, you know, this another old man character, right? And tried to take his house, right? The third book is like, who stole the body of Chester Cools? Was he grave robbed or was he a zombie? So absolutely. You know, I feel like there's a lot of material in these books that make them kind of very straightforward, like mystery. They're straight up like mystery kind of procedurals. But instead of a Sherlock Holmes, you have a, a little black girl kind of leading the, the charge of the mystery. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what. Okay, Netflix, Amazon, <laughs> Hulu. Yeah, it's, you, it's you, yeah, it's a lot of material here. There's a lot of material. All right. So let's we'll just lay <laughs> that. Uh, we'll put a little kindling down and see where we go with yes, this. Yes. Yes. So, what's next for you now that you've you've this you've accomplished along with your collaborator Tanya this journey? What's next for you? You know, more historical fiction, more mysteries. This has been a, a fun time for me as a writer, actually. You know, you were saying that during the pandemic, there have been so many heartbreaking crises. At the same time, it has given some of us a little bit of space, even if we are at home with our children, to kind of think forward about what we want to do and how we want to do it. And I've started work on another historical fiction novel, and it's another mystery. And I think that is, that's my home. I think that's, that's where, that's where my imagination lives. And I didn't think this at the beginning of my writing career, but I have fallen in love through the trials and tribulations of trying to craft a mystery novel, plot a mystery novel, I have fallen in love with them. And I'm excited to continue to write them. Fantastic. And uh, so I'm curious, and I interviewed a gentleman, and I think it was right when I first got to Las Vegas, so probably July timeframe, Lee Matthew Goldberg, and he lives in New York. I don't know, maybe you know him in the writing circles, but you live in New York. I haven't been there Oh my God, in many years, I would love to go back. But wh where do you write? Where's your Where's your writing spot? 
Oh my gosh. Well, you know, the last novel in the trilogy, I spent just, you know, at a desk right outside my kitchen. I didn't have a proper study. I still don't, right? I still just am at a desk in an entryway. And I wrote that book mainly between the hours of like 3.45 a.m. and 7 a.m. Because with a kid and with a job, that was the only time I could find to write. So for me, it hasn't actually been so much about the space. (laughs) It's about the time. You know, the time, you know, has outweighed the the space factor. So just just at a desk wherever I can shove it. (laughs) Okay, gotcha. Well, yeah, when I was chatting with uh, Lee, he was talking about a, a, a he had a special tree at the park. Mm-hmm. Oh, Central Park. Central Park. He called it the writing tree. So I made. Oh, I asked him nice. if he would send a picture of the tree, so I put it in the show notes. So, all right. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh, I wonder where you write. If our listeners would like to continue to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Sure. Well, please check out my website, victoriabondauthor.com. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You know, my name, pretty simple, Victoria Bond. So thanks so much. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we will definitely provide links back to your website, uh, victoriabondauthor.com, and also to your social sites. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. It's like the the big three and occasionally LinkedIn shows up there as well. Mm-hmm. Victoria, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to to have you on Success Insight Podcast to hear the story and the work that you and your collaborator, Tanya, have crafted, co-created, and really it isn't in, in it's provided me an opportunity. I know when I'm I'm gonna binge watch some TV shows, but I'm also going to be reading some books. And so definitely looking forward to to diving in closer with the Zora and Me trilogy. So thank you so much for that gift. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to talk with you. Fantastic. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with award-winning author Victoria Bond. Together with her collaborator, Tanya R. Simon, they have co-created the Zora and Me trilogy, a fictionalized account of the childhood of American author and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston. And really, folks, you know, this what a great story. I mean, this woman, very successful growing up and her journey and how this journey was then kind of informing the theories that Victoria and Tanya have put together. And really, it's provided, at least for me, a stepping stone to want to learn more about Zora Neale Hurston and to go beyond just the fiction or the of the story and also the reality of the nonfiction work. And really, you know, that's what I love about this podcast. It's, it's insight. It's, it's giving folks an opportunity to go into some directions they may not have necessarily thought they would go into. So we really appreciate really being a part of that journey here on success inside podcast and really with authors like Victoria folks, Do go out and once again and check out Victoria's work on our website, Victoria Bond Author. And also let us know what you think of the podcast. So visit us on successinsightpodcast.com. Please leave us a comment about this episode as well as commenting on any of our other podcast episodes that are in our library. You can also find us on Facebook and on LinkedIn. We have Success Insight Podcast pages. And if downloading this to your smart device is your way to go, you can find us on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora. I think I got them all. And we're also on YouTube. All right, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Stay safe, practice social distancing, wear your mask, and we will see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.